All right, let's take a trip down memory lane to the late 90s. Red and blue Pokemon games, anime on TV, and collecting those cards like they were diamonds. And... That was the shared experience of the average fan. But playing the trading card game? We, we don't do that again. The thought of playing the game never crossed my mind. I just wanted the cards. Hell, most people around me were not interested in playing either. When the cards came up in playground conversations, it was always about what cards you had and not what deck you built. You can see it in the sales figures too. The TCG game did well, don't get me wrong, but compared to the mainline games, maybe not even a quarter of the fans were into it. There's this notion that maybe a lot of kids played the game just by reading the rules, but I'ma be real, I never met a single kid who read the rules and knew how to play. Now my friends who did learn the game usually pointed to this gym for helping them out. The same goes for me. My interest in playing the game came around during the black and white sets. Nobody at my local hangout played the game. Only my friend played and he was in college at the time with no time to spare. Now, a few questions have always floated in my mind ever since I played the Game Boy game and Paper Play. One, why is it so damn hard to find people to play with? I mean, Pokemon is everywhere, yet finding fellow players is like hunting for shinies. The locals near me doesn't even have a Pokemon day for players. I know my experience alone is purely anecdotal, but I'm not alone in this. There's threads online, videos from other creators, everyone's wondering where the player's at. It sounds crazy for me to say this knowing that the game is alive and well with player participation at an all time high, with one of the recent regionals in Philly having 1800 players plus in attendance. Why does it feel like I'm pulling teeth to find other players who enjoy the game? Then there's this weird realization I had that a lot of the early Pokemon cards that I played with were a lot more fun and interesting to mess around with than early Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Now mind you, I've played competitive Yu-Gi-Oh for 15 plus years and I've played competitive Pokemon on and off for a total of four to five years. So there is no bias in me saying that. I'm not the biggest fan of early Yu-Gi-Oh. I think a lot of the early formats are too slow for my taste and early card design is utterly abysmal. I don't think Konami had much of an idea of what card design is until 0405. I was expecting the same thing from the Pokemon TCG. I just thought the Pokemon company had no idea how to make a card game or design cards. But I got the exact opposite. Despite that, some Pokemon fans learned how to play the game and they just didn't vibe with it at all. Card design be damned. Even completely without taking modern iterations of the card game into consideration, I just flat out do not like the Pokemon trading card game at its core. When I did play it, I wasn't a huge fan of it. The problem with it, my experience, was a bunch of coin flips, and it was not fun. So what's the deal? How come most Pokemon fans don't vibe with the card game as much as I did? So in this video, we're going to talk about the video game, the card game, my opinions on the mechanics, the history behind the making of this game, and multiple reasons on why the Pokemon TCG isn't as big as it should be. You name your character and you start the game in a lab. You're told that there are rare cards held by the best TCG players, the Grandmasters. The Grandmasters are on the lookout for the strongest players to inherit the rare cards and etch their names into history. It's a simple game with a narrative as exciting as watching a star player cook in Showdown, but hey, it's not like we picked up this game for the story, right? The main purpose of this game is to teach people how to play the game and also give people good deck building ideas and tips. Our journey starts not with a lab and a starter Pokemon, but with a lab and a starter deck. Most folks probably thought that they were stepping into the Pokemon world, but nope, this is kind of like our own world. Pokemon here are like works of fiction, much like our world, but the twist is that the only thing that matters here is the TCG. A few lab rats take you to the side to teach you the ropes. Now for those who mostly came around for my Yu-Gi-Oh videos and anyone else who happens to find this video somehow, let me break down the rules for you. You start with a 60 card deck, shuffle, and draw 7 cards. There's an active slot and a bench. You gotta play a basic Pokemon on the active slot. If you got more basics, toss them on the bench, but it can only hold up to 5 at a time. Now, if you don't have a basic Pokemon, you have to put the cards back into the deck and draw 7 cards again. You must do this over and over again until you have a basic that you could put down in the active slot. There is no penalty for mulligans, but in the future, your opponent draws each time you do a mulligan. From there, flip a coin for the turn order and six cards from the top of the deck become your precious prize cards. When you knock out your opponent's Pokemon, you snatch a prize card. Once you've snatched all the prize cards, you're the winner. Yippee! 
Now it's time to talk about the fuel for the battles, energies. They're like the land cards in Magic the Gathering. You can only hand out one energy per turn to one of your Pokemon. Once your Pokemon has enough energy to attack, it's showtime. Every Pokemon has a retreat cost. It's like the price to pay to switch them out with the bench warmer. Evolving your Pokemon is like leveling up. After a turn on the field, they can evolve if you got the right card in hand. If there's another evolution stage, you'll have to wait till the next turn to evolve it again. Now, there's a whole bunch of other rules to this game, but I'm not gonna dump all that on you right now. We'll talk about them when the time comes. After a mock game, you walk with the professor and you pick your starter deck. I had a plan to make a certain fraud shine, so I went with the Charmander deck. I'm more of a Bulbasaur person, but I've dabbled with the Earth before. You know, played with grass types. Red, I mean fire, is all about hitting hard for a hefty price. You gotta pay the price for power by either damaging yourself or ditching energy attached to the Pokemon. Not every fire Pokemon is a self-inflicting arsonist, but that's the benchmark. It's like playing red decks in Magic the Gathering. They're known for being aggressive, rushing down with creatures, or burning the opponent and their creatures. Not every red deck plays the same though, but 6 out of 10 times, they're pulling out the fire. Yu-Gi-Oh used to be the same way in the early days with things such as zombies being able to revive each other, or warriors using their effects and magic to swarm the field. However, over the years, the mechanics started being more tied to deck types rather than types and attributes. Except dragons, they're just able to do everything for no reason. I personally like it when card mechanics are closely but not fully tied to a type. It makes things easier for new players, you know. Just by looking at what deck it is or what color it is, they could already have an idea of what your deck can do. Now, let's talk about the deck that they threw my way. My boo boo was all different colors. It was like. <laughs> Instead of hitting me with just fire type Pokemon and a few colorless cards, they went all out, giving me cards of every type. Mix and match, avoid bad matchups, it sounds good, right? But it gets really overwhelming staring at all these cards, especially for a player just trying to figure out deck building in this game. For a simple game, this is where things get a bit complicated. Not for me, but for someone who's never played a trading card game before. And this is where most Pokemon fans might not see eye to eye with their trading card game. The core concept of the mainline games clash with the concepts of card games. In the mainline games of Pokemon, it's very possible to beat the game with just about anything. You want to beat the game with a Dunsparce, Chad Odd, whatever other shit mon, go ahead, go have it. The average playthrough and the fun of it comes down to making teams of different varieties of Pokemon. Majority of players tend to just make a team of their favorite Pokemon and take a whack at it. In the TCG, with the way that the game was made and how the rules are, you have to face some very harsh realities about the game from the get-go. You can't just throw all your favorite cards into the deck. Now that goes for any card game, but with Pokemon, I feel like the average player coming into it were just people with not much experience in card games and how they work. Say someone's favorite Pokemon are the three starters in Pikachu, because Red is their favorite character or some shit. Since this person is new to card games, they won't have much of an understanding of what deck building concepts are. Most of the concepts are pretty nebulous and you really can't grasp them until you start playing the game and understanding how things flow. So this person might end up with four copies of the basic, the stage one, and two cards of these Pokemon. If that's the case, that's 40 Pokemon cards in a deck. With only 20 slots left for a combination of trainer and energy cards? Damn, he don't got a clue in the fucking world. <laughs> Good luck. This deck literally cannot do anything. And this is an extreme case. Even if I configured the number of cards and apply modern day deck building, every result would still be kind of dog shit. The energy requirement of these cards is way too selfish to have them all in one deck. You'll be spreading yourself thin with all these different types of energies that you have to put into the deck. Imagine getting the right cards to have the Blastoise and Venusaur line on the board, only to be stuck with drawing lightning and fire energies. I mean, if that happened to me, I'd kill my spoon. You can't even play the game with a deck like this. And in the case of this game, where you only start with one copy of cards that cycle through your deck, the idea of potentially building a deck of your favorite Pokemon is shattered immediately. <laughs> And before y'all get on my case about the fact that I use such a shitty deck as an example, thinking what kind of person would even make a deck like that? Hear me out. In Yu-Gi-Oh, I've met people back in 05 telling me that I can't beat their Thunder deck. They made a Thunder deck because their favorite card was Thunder Nian Nian. In a time of Yu-Gi-Oh where there's no Thunder support, yet you have a Thunder deck. In the early days of competitive Pokemon, they used to have 25 to 30 energies in their decks. 
the average count for competitive decks later on in that format became 15, maybe 16 maximum. So if competitive players were putting 25 plus energies in their deck and that wasn't even optimal in the long run, what do you think casual players were doing? Even if you learn how to build your deck properly, would you even enjoy playing a deck based around one or two Pokemon as a fan of Pokemon? In these moments of being frustrated with how the game is, it's very easy to focus on the things that you don't like and tunnel in on it. But if you step back, you might end up seeing another picture. Sure, you can't make a singular deck of all your favorite Pokemon, however, you can make multiple decks that focus on one or two of your favorites as a compromise. Now, that may not be enough for some people, and that's fine, I get it. But for me, as someone who loves to build decks in any old game, I love it. Now earlier, it might have sounded like I was ragging on the rules and the cards, but don't get it twisted, I like the game and the rules a lot. In fact, I think the people who made this game put a lot of effort into the design of the cards and the rules. I think a lot of the Pokemon in the game are decent enough to build decks around. It helps that a lot of the cards have stats and attacks and abilities that are exclusive to themselves or rare amongst most cards, which makes almost every card feel unique. But let's get back to the game. Who dares to enter the mayhem versus all or nothing? You gotta kick out any Pokemon that isn't your preferred type or colorless ASAP. The colorless, or I should say normal Pokemon, can use any color of energy to throw down. They're like the wild cards of the game that could be perfect for dodging those bad matchups. Now, I don't have many energies on me. Brokey. To get more energies in this game, you have to beat other people in duels. You get two energy cards this way, which is way too slow to be acceptable. Fortunately, there are other ways to get a shitload of energies in a legit manner. One person in the lab will give you several energies if you beat them. His deck is pretty dog shit to me, but I've seen newcomers struggle with them because they just didn't know how to build a deck properly. However, there is another way that is much better than even that. See, you have three open deck slots to make another deck, and a fourth counting the starter deck. If you dump all of your energies into one of your deck slots, along with several other cards to complete the deck, the game will think you have no energies to spare. Because of this, one of the lab rats will think you have no energy cards left and will hand over 10 energies of each type. You can also repeat the process several times over until you have more than enough energies. I think having about 20 for each type is a good call. Now it's time to talk about the main cards in my playthrough. First, the Charmander line. Charmander is decent for knocking out basic Pokemon. The average health of a basic Pokemon is usually around 40. Put an energy on Charmander turn 1, and by turn 2, you'll put something in the dirt. However, you must discard the energy attached to Charmander if you go for Ember. Charmeleon follows the same game plan, but with a bigger cost and bigger damage. It can knock out most Pokemon in the game in two hits just by using Slash and Flamethrower. Similar to Ember, the only way to use Flamethrower is by discarding an energy card from Charmeleon. One of the drawbacks with this card is that you can't really do anything with it until you have three energies. This makes gaining tempo weird in certain situations where you evolve the Charmander on your next turn, but it can't attack. Huh? A lot of stage 1 Pokemon are under this umbrella of needing 3 energies to do damage, which leads me to believe this was some type of early benchmark to keep the power level of the game in check. The few cards that can attack with 2 energies usually have some kind of weird caveat to it. For some of them it could be that their basic form can only attack with 2 energies. That's an awkward limitation seeing that the average basic card usually only needs 1 energy to attack. There's many other limitations and very few exceptions to the rule. With some of these cards like Charmeleon, you can circumvent the energy cost with double colorless energy or most people call it DCE. A DCE is a special energy card that counts as two energies. So with Charmeleon, you could just put a fire energy on Charmander and by the next turn you could put a DCE, evolve it, and then attack with Slash. And that's a pretty decent sequence to pull off. The next Pokemon, however, is a good example of being too greedy to pull off the same sequence of events. Growlithe is okay with its best quality being that it has 60 HP, which is much higher than the average baby basic Pokemon. Kujo here is decent for this point in the game because having one fully loaded might win you a good chunk of the games against weaker opponents. The issue is how slow it is. Are you slow? 
Argodon needs two fire and one colorless to swing with Flamethrower. The sequence that you can use for Charmeleon simply doesn't work for Cujo. Not to mention the fact that Flamethrower discards a fire energy right after. Top that off with the fact that it has a greedy retreat cost and this card is just too slow and risky to lug around. To me, it's not worth the trouble setting up, but some people find success using this version. Now, this Arcanine would be a lot better if a certain card was still in this game, but I'll talk about that later. As much as I like the card game, one of the small things that annoy me is the fact that Pokemon do not retain the moves they have from the previous stages. In the mainline games, you could just choose to have Ember and Flame Wheel when you evolve your Cyndaquil into Quilava. However, in the card game, the Quilava cannot use the attacks from the previous evolution. Not only is this not accurate to how the main games play, but it also makes a lot of evolution cards awkward to use when you evolve them as soon as possible. You could just wait until you have enough energies on the card, but there's certain cards in the format that shits all over that idea. Also, most basics have very low HP, so there's a chance that the card can die if you hold on too long. Nowadays, most stage 1 or 2 cards tend to have attacks that cause 2 or more energy rather than having them have that awkward turn where they can't attack because they have a 3 cost attack. This wasn't really an issue when I played during the black and white formats and it's still not a problem today so they probably started to make the stage 1 and 2 Pokemon a bit less awkward to use pre-gen 5. Although black and white formats have other issues and reasons why stage 2 Pokemon have problems. But that's a story for someone else to tell. Magmar has a Fire Punch that deals 30 for 2, which is pretty good, and 50 for Plank Dora. It's basically a cheaper Charmeleon, however, the drawback is that HP value is... Oh! Non-evolving basics like Magmar and Hitmonchan have 70 HP usually, while this Magmar barely has more than most babies. Enough, Decent use at the start of the game, but it falls off late game. The last card worth mentioning is the Ponyta. If the energies fall right on this card, you can start doing good damage fast, especially when you evolve it. The issue is that they don't hand you a single rapid dash at the start. Is that what? In real life, physical cards of the Sea Biscuit line were just not printed in the same set. Ponyta came out in base set, and rapid dash came out in jungle. I guess they wanted to replicate that same feeling of one of the cards not being available till later. Get the fuck out of here, little nigga. Take that dumb shit with you. Funny to think that some kid in real life got a ponytail from base set only to not be able to use it because Rapidash wasn't a card yet. And the last card type to mention in my deck are the trainer cards. Think of these as magic cards or sorceries. You can activate as many as you want during your turn only. Professor Oak discards your whole hand to draw 7 cards. This is usually played when you don't have much of a hand left or none at all, so you can just draw 7 cards for free. Computer Search can be played by discarding 2 cards. Once you do that, you can add any card to your deck. <laughs> it doesn't take a genius to know this card is absolutely insane. Bill makes you draw two cards from the deck. Now in the future, they changed the trainer cards and separated them into two classes, supporters and items. You can play as many items as you want on your turn, but you can only play one supporter during your turn. They made these changes because in the early days of this game, you can cycle through almost your entire deck and get the cards that you need when you need it. Most people that I know that play card games usually look at Pokemon with a side eye. The game allows you to grab any card whenever you need it. So how can anyone take this seriously? Let's discuss this. I don't think these few cards along with other cards that make you draw in this game were a design oversight. For example, in Yu-Gi-Oh, Pot of Greed is a huge oversight to me. Pot of Greed was just a narrative tool in the Yu-Gi-Oh manga for the characters to have more cards in their hand and keep the fight going while also keeping the rules and writing consistent. Most cards that let you draw cards for a cost tend to end up being restricted or banned in several card games. So why is it different in Pokemon? Well, for starters, like I said earlier, they changed it so that you could only play one support trainer per turn, so they did pretty much restrict the number of times you can draw in a turn. Most cards in the Pokemon TCG these days still make you draw 7, 6 cards. This is because the core purpose of these kind of cards was to prevent dead hands from happening. Stage 1 and 2 Pokemon do absolutely nothing in your hand until you have the appropriate basic card. On top of that, you're also fishing for the right color energy cards. Incorrect. If cards like Oak and Bill were not a thing, Brother, uh. this game literally cannot work, or at least work well. 
Before I leave the lab, I want to mention the fact that a lot of the NPCs in here are very helpful when it comes to telling you how the game works beyond just the card game. From mentioning how to get more cards in the game to learning how to save and telling you that if your game turns off mid-duel, you can continue from that point in the duel the next time you boot up the game. Which is crazy, I wish other card battlers had that. Oh, also they call all the card battles duels in this game. This is probably the last time they mention card battles being duels because of a certain other property absorbing that word into its DNA. Who dares to enter the main versus All or nothing. Heading out into the world map, I went to the closest building possible, which was the Fight Club. When I went in the building, a kid named Ronald rolled up on me and started gloating about the fact that they just got their first medal and how easy it was to get it. I don't have time for this lion shit. Apparently, you know the clown, which prompts him to ask if you're after the same legendary cards too. When you tell him what you're up to, he just laughs in your face. <laughs> Entering the club, you see the master in the middle of it. He starts to talk shit and claims that you can't even beat him at this point. But if you really want to try that badly, you have to beat the students first. There's three of them across different areas on the map and you gotta go find them. I actually kind of like this. They have the fighting club right next to the lab so that you'll wound up going there first just to be told that to progress a certain point of the game, you'll have to talk to as many NPCs as possible. It's the only way to find out which ones are the students. Majority of the NPCs kind of look the same to me, so personally, I can't really spot the difference. Most people who play RPGs rarely talk to the NPCs, but in this game, you can't really fly with that. You gotta chat up everyone you see to spot the students. In doing so, you'll find out other tips and tricks of the card game along with certain NPCs that are willing to trade for cards. Since I can't do much in the fight club, I head off to go straight towards the grass club. I couldn't find the club leader, so I started snooping around. One person says that the master is out, and when I spoke to another later, she said that she won't say where the master is unless I beat all the club members. Like most of the mainline Pokemon games, you have to beat several of the members of the club in order to fight the leader. In this game, there's usually something in the story that prevents you from seeing the leader as soon as possible. For the first two clubs, I'll go over most of the members and their cards. Afterwards, I'll only cover the leaders of the clubs and opponents outside of the club members because if I was to cover every opponent in this game, we'll be here forever. The first opponent is Brittany. Her deck is just as bad as yours at this point. So I'm guessing they really wanted you to go to the grass gym first, or it's probably one of the first few you're supposed to get out of the way real fast. I went to the grass club first because most of the green cards are weak to fire cards. Most cards have a weakness that tends to follow the logic of either the games or colors. When you hit a Pokemon for their weakness, you do double the damage to it. I'm not the biggest fan of this kind of game mechanic for this game and for several formats in the physical game. I'll explain what I mean when I get to the club leader. Right now, the logic was the fact that I have a fire deck and I was hoping to sweep through the whole grass club with fire cards. But this girl just has a bunch of random cards in her deck with not much of a theme in mind. In fact, her deck is actually called etc in the game. I'm not even joking. This is some small brain shit. Because of having several different types, she hardly has enough energy to do anything half the time. However, your starting deck is just as bad so you might get caught with your pants down like I did. This Pikachu card can low-key steal a game from you. It does 10 damage for 1 energy, and then 30 for 2. On average, this card can knock out most baby basic Pokemon by turn 2. This is only possible because this game allows you to attack on the first turn. You. Are you dumb? Player 1 usually has a slight advantage in the majority of tabletop games, from cards to chess or whatever else. So why the fuck did they think this was okay? Going first is already a huge advantage, and these guys decided that wasn't enough? You can tell this was a dumbass decision because they got rid of this rule down the line. Going back to her, I struggled for a bit at the start but made a comeback. Eat shit for life, bro. When you beat a member of the club, you get a pack. There are four different packs in the game, and each opponent has a specific pack that they hand over to you as a reward. Each pack also has a theme that it loosely follows. Mystery's the pack I just got now, and sources online say that the pack gives mysterious Pokemon. You have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down. If I was to be charitable, I think it's referring to the fossil Pokemon and various other hard to come by Pokemon in the mainline games. Mama! 
The notable card I threw in my deck soon after was Energy Removal. It's a trainer card that simply removes one energy. This card is absolutely busted. Keep this card in mind. I went around talking to the NPCs to try and figure out who else is a club member, and in the process of doing so, I find someone who wants to trade a Vile Plume for an Oddish? Why do you want to downgrade? Whatever, man. If you happen to pick up a Bulbasaur deck, I'm pretty sure this is a worthwhile trade. The Vile Plume has a Poke Power, or Ability for short. Abilities are effects that can trigger during your turn or under certain conditions. For example, Vile Plume can heal 10 damage off of one of your Pokemon once during your turn. You can use this ability from the bench so you can safely heal a Pokemon every turn. This ability is decent if you could get one or two of these on the bench. Kristen's deck focuses on filling out the bench as soon as possible with grass Pokemon. She does this with Oddish and Bellsprout. Don't let the fact that their children fool you. Both having an attack that searches for another copy of themselves. From there, she'll be focusing on evolving her cards and setting up powerful Pokemon with abilities. Weeping Bell is actually really good being one of the few stage 1 cards that's able to inflict 30 damage just for 2 energies. However, its evolution proves that it can only do one thing with that mouth. You suck ass. Victory Bell can switch your opponent's Pokemon from the bench to the active spot. It then has an attack that does 20 damage and prevents you from retreating that Pokemon. So the card gets weaker in exchange for a gimmick? You're just a piece of garbage. The idea is to pull in a Pokemon that's on the bench that hasn't had a time to set up yet. In execution, the scenario rarely happens. It's a stage 2 Pokemon, which means several turns pass by the time they get this out. Any basics you have on the bench are probably stage 1 or 2 cards by then. With only 20 damage, it would take 3 to 4 hits on average to knock out bigger Pokemon, while its previous form could do it in 2 to 3. Fucking thing sucks! She has a card called Pokemon Breeder that puts a stage 2 card on top of the matching baby Pokemon. This makes it much easier for her to evolve Bulbasaur straight into Venusaur. The frog... uh... dinosaur... What is a Venusaur? Anyways, it has the ability to move grass energies that she owns to different Pokemon as many times as she wants. Normally, you would combine this ability with other cards that heal huge amounts of HP. Cards that heal other cards in big amounts usually have the cost of discarding most or all energy attached to the heal Pokemon. With Venusaur, she can move the energy from the damage card to another card, use a healing card on the damage card, and then move the energies back but she doesn't have any healing cards to support this strategy, so the most she could do is move energies off a dying Pokemon to the next card in the lineup. The pack I got after winning was Evolution. It goes without saying that this pack focuses on stage 1 and 2 Pokemon. Oh shit, Sherlock. Heather is supposed to be the monkey wrench in this gym. She has a deck of Eevee cards and its evolutions. Normally, it's not a good idea to have so many different card types in the deck, but most Evolutions only need colorless energies for the first order or second attack. The Eevee itself also has this annoying ass attack that can stall you out by preventing you to attack if she gets the right result. Now, the real twist is that it's not an Eevee deck at all. It's a Venomoth deck. Venomoth could change its type to mimic any Pokemon in play. So, if Vaporeon is on her bench, she could change it to a water type. If Charmeleon is on mines, she could change it to a fire type. So effectively, if she plays her cards right, she can always hit for super effective damage. Now, for two grass energies, the Venomoth can only do 10 damage, which means it'll only be doing 20 damage hitting weakness. However, if she flips for heads, your card is now confused and poisoned. If the stars align, Venomoth can one-shot most of the Pokemon in this game through sheer luck. Status effects are present in the TCG just like the mainline games. Sleep, Paralysis, Poison, and Confusion are all present in this. Burn becomes a status later down the line in the TCG, but wasn't in the game at the start of its life. Most cards that can inflict the status effect usually have to flip a coin for the right result. Poison damages the card for 10 HP in between every turn. The status stays and doesn't go away until you heal it or retreat the Pokemon to the bench. Pokemon on the bench cannot have status effects on them, so retreating to the bench heals all status effects in the game. It's not always that easy though. Confusion, for example, makes a card play Russian Roulette when attempting an attack or retreat. If Tails, the card hits itself for 20 damage if you attempt it and attack. Cards that fall asleep on the job cannot attack or retreat and in between turns, you have to flip a coin. Heads, it wakes up. 
Tails is still snoring. Paralysis prevents the card from taking any actions whatsoever for just one turn. Besides full heal, another way to get rid of status effects, especially the ones that make it difficult to retreat, is by using the card switch. It just switches your active Pokemon with the one on the bench for free. Something that comes up often in the early days of the Pokemon TCG are coin flips. Most effects from Pokemon attacks are determined by flips. Some attacks make it so that the target has a 50% chance to hit, miss, inflict a status, lose a status, draw a card, discard the energy, etc. This was probably to imitate the concept of attacks having a chance to have a secondary effect activate just like the mainline games. I'm not the biggest fan of coin flips, but there are some interesting things you could do with a system like this that I can address in a better light when speaking on certain cards in the next club. After beating the last member of the club, you're told that the club leader is actually in a house in the corner of the map. Once you're over there, you find Nikki. She starts to apologize for leaving the club just to do her own research. The research in question was her studying up on the rulings of the card game. Is she applying to be a judge or something? The house you're in is filled with a bunch of tips and tricks for the TCG, and later on in the game you'll have access to all the information that's here. A lot of it is mostly info on some of the best abilities in the game, along with some hidden mechanics in the game like phantom cards. The phantom cards are rare cards given in card pop. Remember that weird part on the Game Boy that did mostly nothing? Well, on the Game Boy Color, you would use the infrared port to communicate with other Game Boys with games that supported that. In the Pokemon TCG, you can use this function to send and receive cards and decklists. This was a godsend of a function, because most kids at the time just did not have link cable. Now, when the two Game Boys are in close quarters with each other and select card pop, they both receive a random card. This can only be executed with two Game Boys that have never met before. So, if you want to get another card from card pop, you will have to have a third Game Boy to do it with. Then make that Game Boy do the pop with the second Game Boy. Might you be a stripper? Now each time you do this, you get a random card for the most part, but there is a chance to get the elusive phantom cards, I mean card. Only one of the two phantom cards can be obtained, which is Mew. You see, there's a bug in the game that prevents players to ever have a chance of getting the Venusaur. The only way to ever get your hands on the phantom Venusaur is through cheating. Now I don't want to get too deep into detail because there is a whole other video on YouTube by Delta Seeker that does this subject so much more justice than I ever could. So when you get the chance, check out their videos on the Pokemon TCG game as well. Going back to the club, it's now time to face off against the leader. Nikki's goal is to try and get out Execute and Executor as soon as possible. Executor has an attack that flips a number of coins equal to the amount of energies attached to it. So if she has 4 energies attached to it, she flips 4 coins and if 2 of them are heads, she gets 40 damage. This can result in situations where it's either good or utter shit. The club leader has a Venusaur which can easily move the energies around the Exeggutors when needed. That way, it's a one and done investment instead of trying to load up every single card individually. So it's very possible for her to have several energies flying around from card to card and flipping for 6, 10, 14, 18. We gonna kill you dog. With those kind of odds, I think anyone can see that's good enough to get consistent damage. The problem is how long it would take to realistically ramp up to that point. Now as much as I can gas up the card, I can't gas up her performance. I shit it all over her because of the type of advantage. My Ponyta took out her ace card with no problem. A non-evolved Pokemon killed an Exeggutor with zero issues. I don't even have Rapidash in the deck yet. Something that always bothered me about the Pokemon TCG was weaknesses and resistances. Majority of the cards have a weakness and resistance that follows the logic of the mainline games. And just like the mainline games, if you hit the weakness, you do double damage. If a card resists your card, it will take 30 less damage. Now the issue I have with this is not the system itself, but the execution of it. If you're playing with a water deck and most of the cards are weak to electric, no matter how good your deck can be, it will always struggle against thunder decks. Blastoise, Lapras, so many low cost water Pokemon are weak to thunder. Instead of setting decks up to have horrendous matchups, why not give different weaknesses and resistances that make sense? Have Lapras weak to fighting because it's an ice typing in the game. Seeking could be weak to grass instead. In 
this club's case, Exeggutor could have been weak to Psychic because Psychic types beat Psychic in the early days. It don't make no more fucking sense. This is not all bad though. With a system like this, it does force people to build their decks in a way where that they have to keep their weaknesses in mind. If you're playing with a water deck, maybe you should have some fighting cards to cover your deck's weaknesses. You do lose some consistency with this compromise though, so it's not a catch-all answer. Nowadays in the TCG, it seems that they wisened up to how stupid it is to have whole decks set up to lose to a specific matchup. And with Terra being a mechanic in the card game, they experiment a lot more with weaknesses. I think this kind of system can be a turnoff to people who are a fan of the mainline games and seasoned veterans of card games. It's one thing to have difficult matchups, but it's a whole nother story when the matchup is so heavily skewed in one direction that it's basically a non-game. Hell, there's some pretty good cards in this format that will never see the light of day because they have terrible matchups against the best cards in the meta. Thankfully, modern day Pokemon is far and away from this problem. So this isn't really a thing to worry about nowadays. Going back to the game, the first medal is finally acquired. Now that her and the others are beating, you can rematch them whenever you want. So if you ever feel like your deck is too weak for the next part of the game, you can always go back and just grind some of the past opponents. I don't understand science? Don't worry, you're not the only one, because after the last few years, the majority of people don't even understand what a vaccine is. All you scary ass niggas not getting the vaccine? You're the problem. This is the science club. At first, I almost thought this club was based around psychic Pokemon, but there's already a psychic club elsewhere. This club's theme is not a type, but a playstyle instead. Most of the players here focus on cards that inflict status effects. Yeah, I'm aware that a lot of you niggas don't like it. A lot of the cards used in here are mostly Pokemon that were bug or poison types in the mainline games. Eric is probably the most difficult goon here. The booty beads are unironically a problem. It's one of the few cards with a high potential to inflict 50 damage total in two turns. For just one energy, it can inflict 10 damage and then flip a coin for poison. With the poison, that's another 10 at the end of the turn, 10 after you pass, and another 10 when they attack again, and once more at the end of their turn. Since he can attack on the first turn, going first and getting the poison can lead to a huge swing in momentum for little cost. Coughing is low-key one of the best basic Pokemon cards in the game. In fact, it's better than most stage 1 and 2 Pokemon. For 2 energy, it deals 10 damage and flips. One result poisons the target while the other confuses. This is incredibly powerful because not only does it have the same damage potential as the ass beads, but it can possibly do more. Get the right flips and you could possibly stack confusion and poison on top of each other. Now, by the time it could do that, most Pokemon might be dead already. But for bulkier Pokemon, this can be an easy death sentence. It's very rare for a card in early Pokemon to have a coin flip effect that's positive either way. Speaking of coin flips, I'm not really a big fan of the coin flip effects in this game, and I'm not alone in this either. The coin flips in this game are probably another factor in the reason why a lot of Pokemon fans probably don't vibe with the TCG much. Hell, even veteran card game players stay away from the Pokemon TCG because of the things they hear about the coin flips in the game. At some point, a lot of the coin flip effects became better over the years. By the time I was playing competitively in black and white, coin flip effects were either phased out or if a card did have it, it was usually a pretty good effect. Now, flipping a coin for an effect is not all bad. For example, the coughing earlier is probably one of the best coin flip cards in the game and is probably going in the direction that I would like to see more coin flip cards go in. That Venomoth I talked about earlier, I prefer it to have coughing's effect rather than an all or nothing effect. There's some cards that have attacks where that they do a set amount of damage and can do more damage if they flip for heads or damage themselves and do the regular amount of damage if they get tails. Cards like that add another layer for the players to play around the coin flips without feeling like they got stained with the losing or less than result. The reality though is that in the beginning of the TCG, they ended up printing a lot of cards that can completely miss with their coin flips. No, I miss it makes sense to make a player flip for a status effect because a lot of them are powerful on top of doing damage to the target with an attack already. Some cards just straight up inflict the status without the coin flip, although those tend to do no damage initially, which is fine. The coin flips that really annoy me in this game are the ones where you have to flip for damage. 
Remember that vile plume I showed earlier in the video? Well, it has an attack that's just plain dick on the ground dog shit. And it shows you what I mean when I say I hate how most of the coin flip cards are designed in the early days. Flip 3 coins. The attack does 40 damage times the number of heads. Now, I flipped for this attack 3 times, cause on average this card might live for 2 or 3 turns. First time I got 40 damage. The second time I also got 40 damage. But the last time, I got 0. Why are you fucking with me? WHY ARE YOU FUCKING WITH ME?! Yeah, you could straight up get zero damage in this game with attacks that have multiplication going on. But that's not all. After you use this move, the card confuses itself right after. Which means the next time you want to use this attack, you have to flip a coin for the confusion check. And then flip for damage. You can smell the bullshit that can happen out of this. I get that Pedal Dance confuses the user after 2-3 to three turns of using it in the mainline games, but did you have to be this faithful? It already has a lot going against it. Vileplume's a stage 2 Pokemon, needs 3 energies, and it can miss, and it flicks a status effect on itself. Like bro, one of these negatives have to go man, they don't all have to be here. Sure, if you get 2 good flips, that's 80 damage which KOs most cards in the format. But the amount of setup it takes just for a chance for that to happen, it's a scam. Joe Button told me it was a Ponzi scheme and I was gonna go to jail. Cards in the future of the TCG that deal with coin flips are designed more like coughing and less like Vile Bloom. However, the majority either read like Vile Bloom or just have a 50% chance to inflict the status effect in the beginning of the card game. At the very least, it does give this feeling that most cards can at least do something. The last guy has a deck around flying Pokemon, and it's doing anything but flying because it's dick on the ground bad. Only Pokemon worth mentioning is the Golbat. This card can heal itself depending on how much damage it does. Now, this is a pretty good attack, but you need 3 energies for this, which is a lot to ask for. In a deck revolving around Golbat, you can probably pull this off, however his deck has several other birds that need 3-4 to four energies to do anything. Take this Pidgeot. For 3 energies, it can take the target active Pokemon and return the card and every card attached to it to the hand. Now, ideally, if you use this on a target that your opponent invested a lot of resources in, you can set them several turns back. The reality is that most of the best cards at the time did not need much investment in order to do what they do well. Not to mention the fact that the person playing the Pidgeot has to invest in all of their own resources and turns into this dumb Ponzi scheme since it's a stage 2 Pokemon. Joe Button told me it was a Ponzi scheme and I was gonna go to jail. After this guy, I was able to add some more cards to my deck to give it some fire power. I can't even say that shit with a straight face. I am Lady Haha. -ha. Clefairy Doll is a trainer card that acts like a Pokemon if you put it in play. It has 10 HP and when your opponent knocks it out, they don't get a prize card for it. You use the card mostly to stall for a turn or two and invest in a Pokemon without much trouble. Gambler shuffles your hand into the deck and you flip a coin. Get it right, you draw 8 cards. Get it wrong, you draw 1. It sounds like shit at first. But because half the time I play out my whole hand anyways, you can possibly play this card and just draw 8 cards for free for the cost of nothing. Gambler is also one of the only few cards I can use right now to give my deck a speed boost, because this game does not want to give me any copies of a certain professor. Rick has a very problematic deck that I wouldn't recommend fighting so early. The main goal of the deck is to stall long enough until his game plan is complete. He has 3 lines of Pokemon that allows him to do this with ease. The first to mention is the 4 copies of Coughing in the deck, and I already spoke on why this card is so good. The second is Porygon. It can change his resistance to any type in the game, taking 30 less damage. With this, he was able to take no damage from most of my fire cards. This is an insanely good card to stall with, but it has a few problems. It has horrendous HP, meaning that it could be knocked out by damn near anything in the game. On top of that, it can only change its resistance to one type at a time. Switch into a Pokemon that it doesn't resist at the time, and it's cooked. The last issue is the fact that it can't resist colorless cards. If you build your deck right, you should be able to get around the Porygon. 
However, if you only have a mono type deck, it might be damn near impossible to kill it in a timely fashion. The last card that could stall more consistently than the Porygon is the Grimer. This annoying piece of shit uses Minimize to decrease the damage from incoming attacks by 20 for one energy. Hearing that by itself, it doesn't sound too crazy. But when you factor in that some of the best cards in this format can't even knock it out without putting insane amounts of resource up, you can see how annoying this pile of ooze really is. To put this into perspective, one of its counters, Mewtwo, cannot even knock it out in a timely fashion. Mewtwo does 10 damage plus 10 more for each energy on the target. Since the Grimer will only have one, it will only do 40 damage. But if it already did minimize, then it's only doing 20, meaning that it needs to hit two more times before it dies. This is applying weakness, by the way. Now, what's the point for Rick to be stalling this much? Let me show you. The X-Ball Merchant is usually pretty good across multiple formats of Pokemon. And these two are the ones that started the trend. Now, the other one I mentioned a bit as an example, but I didn't mention the fact that it can discard the energy to prevent any incoming damage to it, as if he couldn't possibly stall enough already. The promo Mewtwo is the main attacker of the deck. For one energy, it can attach two more psychic energies from the discard pile onto itself. This is insane energy acceleration and it could really push him far ahead in the game if done as soon as possible. All it takes for him is to play an oak or computer search, discard some energies, and attach the discarded energies to Mewtwo. By the time it's the next turn, he's already attacking for 40 damage, which knocks out most basic Pokemon in the game. This Mewtwo is really crazy to me and it stands out the most amongst most of the cards. You'd think people would base whole decks around this card, but nope. See, a good chunk of Mewtwo cards in the TCG tend to be flexible enough to play in any deck. For example, the base set Mewtwo only needs a Psychic and a Colorless Energy. This is a very lenient cost for an attack that can hit for 30 to 40 on average. Any deck can afford to add a few Psychic Energies because there are so many cards that can filter through the deck to get specific energies with ease. And since it only needs one energy of a specific color, it makes it all the much easier. Now, this is Mewtwo's biggest strength, but also its biggest weakness. Not sure if I can make this claim for the entirety of its history in the TCG, but for the formats I played in, Mewtwo's biggest weakness has always been itself the majority of the time. Both Mewtwo's can one-shot each other and itself. And since base set Mewtwo is easy to throw into any deck, it's difficult to have widespread tournament success with a deck that loses to a card most decks already play. As stack as his deck is, I beat the dog shit out of him just through pure luck. See, one of the new cards I added to my deck was Nine Tails. This is the best and worst card ever. For three energies, you could flip eight coins. You do 10 damage times the amount of heads you get. So at the most, you could finesse a free kill with 80 damage like how I did here on the first try. And at worst, you get Nothing! Because this costs 3 energy, ideally on a turn to turn basis, you want to do 30 damage at the least. Now, I already did the math and consulted multiple people about the probability and chance with this card. And it came down to having an 85% chance to do 30 damage at the least and more with this attack. Every time I do flips in real life, I tend to get 30 or more damage 9 out of 10 times. The funny thing about this card is that it's not even a real card. This card is exclusive to the Game Boy game and it was never printed in real life. The only reason this picture exists is because it's a mock-up version of it in a card book made in the year 2000 that lists every card ever made up until that point in real life and in this game. Anyways, I beat the dog shit out of Rick. My Ninetales was flipping more than Scalpers. On my way out, I ran into the sweaty ass rival. He starts to downplay your wins by saying you won through pure luck and decides to catch an ass whooping for himself. You're not the government. 
Now get out. Ronald's deck is a mix of water, fire, and fighting cards. Now the fire cards he has, I went over them in the start of the video. So for now, I'll cover the water and fighting cards. Squirtle is a bit annoying having a 1 energy, 10 damage attack that has a chance to paralyze your card. Its evolution War Turtle can be a bit problematic if you were sitting on your ass the whole match. 40 damage for 3 energy is nothing to scoff at, but it's pretty standard across most cards, so it ain't special. It has the usual problem most stage 1 and 2 Pokemon have where that if it evolves too early, it doesn't do much. At the very least in War Turtle's case, it can use Withdraw for a chance to protect itself from damage. The Dugong line is a bit scarier, but again, nothing special. It's a bit out of the ordinary for a card to do 50 damage for 3 energy, but the second attack is clearly not worth that much energy. The real MVPs of the deck are Lapras and Marowak. This Lapras is insanely annoying to deal with and is probably a must have in several water deck playthroughs. A basic Pokemon with a high amount of HP and really good attack. Water Gun does 10 damage plus 10 more for each energy on it. Huh? Oh, God. Now, it has a cap, being that only 20 damage max can be added on. When you compare it to, let's say, War Turtle, it doesn't seem that much better, but just being a basic Pokemon alone puts it over so many cards since you don't have to fish through your deck looking for specific evolutions just to access higher damage. It also has a Saki second attack that has a chance to inflict confusion, which has fucked me over multiple times in my playthrough. Now, the Marowak line to me is one of the more annoying Pokemon lines to deal with, and I'm surprised a lot of people glance over them. Specifically Cubo. I hate this little bitch. That's why your mama did. For one energy, it can use Snivel, and it starts to wipe tears and boogers off its face just to take 20 less damage. It's very similar to the Grimer. However, this card can take small amounts of damage it takes and send it right back at you with Rage. This does 10 damage plus 10 more damage for each damage counter on it for 2 energies. So if it lost 30 HP, Rage would do 40 damage. The real annoyance from this card is its ability to stall. It's only reek the grass types and it's difficult to come by good grass cards because there's not that many. <laughs> but the other annoyance is that it resists electric. There are meta defining cards that can't really beat over it with ease. Now it does have an opening. If you bench the Pokemon that was active when it started to cry like a bitch, the new Pokemon won't give a shit about its tears and can do full damage to it. Keep in mind, it still has rage, so if you don't one-shot it at that moment, you'll take a bone to the face. The Marowak isn't too crazy. It can potentially bone you with 60 damage for just 2 energy, or get absolutely nothing out of its attack. It's a high roller feeling lucky in Vegas type of card. This fight shouldn't be too much trouble for most. The new card I mentioned earlier was putting in that work. On top of that, I also got copies of Rapidash so the Ponytas I have can finally be put to more use. Sea Biscuit can do 20 damage for 2 energies with a chance to inflict 10 more damage. The real draw is the second attack for 3 energy. It deals 30 damage and it flips a coin. Call it right and Spirit here won't take any damage on their turn. A lot of people who make fighter decks in this game tend to land on this Pokemon to use and for good reason. After the fight, he immediately starts to make excuses. I wasn't trying that hard. Hospital tested, clinically proven bullshit. Instead of getting a pack, you get a promo card. There's several cards in the game that you can only obtain through game progression and certain events, and this is one of them. So is the Jigglypuff any special? Not really. Fine. I mentioned earlier in the video that fire cards can play around with the idea of sacrificing resources for more damage, and while most cards in this gym reflect that, another concept this club focuses on is rage. My love, my anger, and all of my sorrow! There are several cards used in this club that will take damage inflicted to their HP and add it on to their attack power. The energy requirement is not the same amongst most Rage users though, with some only needing 2 energies and others 3. Tauros is a card that's in several decks in this club and has an upgraded version of Rage called Rampage. Instead of starting at 10 damage like Rage, it starts at 20. This version has a slight drawback though. You must flip a coin and if the result is Tails, Tauros is confused after inflicting the damage. This card is pretty good and I found myself using it later on in the game when I pulled some copies from the packs. 
With the first attack stomp, it's easy to get some quick damage and then KO the target. Very easy to use in any deck, pretty annoying when you have to fight it yourself. The poster child for rage decks, even in paper play, is Promo Arcanine. Now, this version of Kujo has an upgraded version of rage called Flames of Rage. For just 2 energy, it starts off with 40 attack and it adds more power to that for each damage counter on it. Because of the high base power of the attack, this attack has a lot more potential to KO targets sooner along with the ability to KO bigger targets. In true fire type fashion though, you have to discard 2 fire energies attached to it after attacking with this attack. Now it does have quick attack, but it starts off pretty weak with a chance to do 30 damage or just 10. To have an easier time with this club, I added Porygon to my deck so that I can resist the fire card in the club. In paper play, it's okay, but in this game, Porygon is probably one of the best cards to stall with since the clubs lean heavy to one type. Although this is a fire club, his deck is a mix of normal and fire cards. I think it's safe to say that the fire cards actually hold back the rest of the deck. If you went in trying to counter him with water cards, you'll end up finding out that you don't have as much advantage as you thought. Now, he has the same Arcanines and Magmars that I have. I'm not a fan of the Arcanine, and while the Magmars are decent, they're nowhere near as good as the other cards in the deck. Tauros is in the deck and it's annoying to deal with at times. He has several copies of Promo Jigglypuff, which isn't too crazy, but this other copy of Puff is annoying. It could put a target to sleep for one energy, which is pretty unique for a basic card all things considered. Most basic cards usually flip for a status effect if it's just for one energy. Wigglytuff can put a card to sleep for one energy with Lullaby. This isn't too out the ordinary because there are other stage 1 cards that can do that for the same cause. What is out of the ordinary is a signature attack due to wave. This attack does 10 damage plus 10 more for each Pokemon on the bench. So at max, this move can do 70 damage, which one shots some of the best cards in the game. Now it does cost 3 energies, but a DCE can easily pay for most of that plus it can still stall with Lullaby. With 80 HP, even cards that can hit it for weakness might have difficulty one shotting it. Due to Wave is one of the most iconic decks of this era, and it's easy to see why. This fat foot ass bitch is one of the most insane cards in the Pokemon TCG. To start, this card has a whopping 120 HP, and it's a basic. Majority of cards will need 3 to 4 hits in order to KO this card. Even some of the best fighting type cards in the game will have issues killing it, whether it's because they don't do enough damage or they need a lot of setup to work. On top of being hard to kill easily, it's hard to actually hit. For 2 energy, Scrunch flips a coin, and if it's heads, it takes no damage from attacks on your turn. So while you're sitting there struggling to kill it, it starts using GTA cheats. The most egregious part to me about this card is the retreat cause. Most of the time, the fatties have to pay 3 to 4, but for some reason, Chansey only has one retreat cause. What kind of shit is that? 50 base speed in the mainline games, by the way. I cannot tell you the number of times it was close to death, only for them to retreat to another Chansey. This duel lasted 20 minutes because of bad flips. I was able to have an easier time knocking out the Chanseys with poison and close the game out with Rapidash. With that, I obtained the third medal. Who dares to enter the main versus All or nothing. Before that though, I want to recap and give some more context to some of the things said in this video. First, I'll start with the quotes that I grabbed from two other videos about the Pokemon TCG. Now, one of them was from Tamahiro, who is not only one of the biggest Pokemon fans on the platform, she's also one of the bigger OG YouTube creators. She's been making videos for 13 years? Dang. Anyways, I used a clip from her video about the Pokemon TCG because the video gave me perspectives about a lot of the trouble new players might experience with the game. See, I played card games for over a decade. Maybe two at this point. I don't really remember how I approached the games and how much trouble I had wrapping my head around starting concepts about them. In fact, I was probably more likely to not have much trouble because of my history with learning multiple fighting games, which have very similar learning curves to card games. Something I brought up earlier in the video was the idea that some Pokemon fans might not like the TCG because of the concept of deck building clashes with the concept of team building in the mainline games. Now obviously at a high level, both share more similarities than differences. However, at a casual level, the differences are a lot more apparent as I brought up earlier in the video. 
I got this realization from Tama's video and her experience as a fan of Pokemon not being able to enjoy the card game the same way she enjoys the mainline games. Because of my years of experience in card games, I never would have thought about how a person might feel about being locked to one or two Pokemon and colors instead of a wide variety of them like they're probably used to in the mainline games. That person would have to rewire the way they approach and enjoy Pokemon and without another person to ease them through that, they probably tapped out as soon as they got in. Tama ends her video acknowledging the fact that her complaints about the game may be small in the grand scheme of things and admits that it probably just isn't for her. Although some of the frustrations she had were a bit wacky, they're all ultimately valid because a good chunk of the fans probably share the same sentiments. Now the other clip I played earlier in the video was from Rarin. He's a creator on the site that focuses on Hearthstone. Recently, he's taken some time to learn other card games with a series of videos where he tries to get as far into the ranks of these games as he can before he gives his final opinion on the game. People who play Yu-Gi-Oh are literally brain dead. Why the fuck did I do that? He's someone who's very familiar with card games, which is the reason why I wanted to bring up his clip. To show that for a long time, card game players from other games often had the surface level sentiment that the game was a bunch of coin flips, even before I had interest in learning. All I heard about the Pokemon TCG was that it was just a bunch of coin flips. Now, in his video, that was his initial impression. But after learning the ins and outs of the game, he begins to see that the flips are not really a major part of the game. It exists, but it's not something you come across that often. So how do people end up with this impression even though the coin flips are not a factor even in mid-level play? Well, a lot of the beginner's traps in this game are coin flip cards. When you first take a glance at this game, some of the cards that stand out the most are the coin flippers. Wow, I could search any Pokemon in my deck if I get hit? Oh, that came out wrong, what the fuck? Wow, I could do 120 damage? Alright, let me walk you through an exercise. You're looking to put a searcher in your deck, and you must choose between these two cards, Pokeball and Trader. Trader allows you to pick one Pokemon in your hand and swap it with another Pokemon in the deck. If you have 7 cards in your hand and play Trader, you end up with 6 cards at the end of it because you had to give up a card to play it. Having less cards in your hand doesn't feel ideal in most cases. Now, Pokeball allows you to search for any Pokemon if you win the 50-50 flip. In terms of card advantage, if you have 7 cards in hand and activate Pokeball, if you win the flip, you still end up with 7 cards in your hand at the end, which is really good. Which card are you more inclined to add to your deck? If you chose Pokeball, you stupid. Trader is the more ideal card to have in a deck, not because it's a better card per se, but because you're more likely to have another Pokemon in your hand to get a guarantee search from Trader. Plus, if you fail the Pokeball flip, you end up with nothing. That doesn't mean Pokeball is bad, it's a high roller card. The risk reward should be weighed like that. But ultimately, to me, it's mid. Now, two questions are probably in your head right now. One, why did I have to do that exercise? And two, if Pokeball is mid, why waste ink and print OK and bad cards? Well, I can answer both of those with one answer. Bad and OK cards exist to give players an opportunity to evaluate cards and figure out for themselves what makes a card good. It's one of the few instances where you can have a learning experience outside of peer-to-peer -peer play. Just from that exercise, you now know what's the benchmark on being a good searcher. You can look at Call for Family and deduce that the attack is not worth doing since it does no damage, ends your turn, and can only search for a Pokemon in this card's line. Trader doesn't do damage either, but it doesn't end your turn, and it can grab any Pokemon by swapping one in your hand. The reason there are a good chunk of cards that have all or nothing flip effects is for you as a player to evaluate for yourself why these cards are less ideal to play than something that may do a bit less but is guaranteed. So essentially a lot of newcomers kind of fall into their trap and come out of the game thinking that the game's a bunch of coin flips. This statement looms over Pokemon to this day and it's become one of the catch all responses for some on why they don't play the game. I'm here to say that if you learn how to play and deck build, you'll soon realize that is not the case at all. If you're a fan of Pokemon, I recommend watching their videos and experiences with the TCG. Their videos helped a lot with the ideas and concepts I had while writing the script for this video. Who dares to enter the main versus all or nothing? 
Once you get the third medal, something happens in another part of the map. See on the map here, there's this building at the top of it and you can't do much with it until this point. This is the challenge cup. Here you play in a single elimination tournament with three rounds. In the first one that happens in the game at this specific point, you battle for a chance to attain the level 60 Mewtwo. In between rounds, you have a chance to change up your deck, similar to a cyborg in Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic the Gathering. However, traditional tournaments of Pokemon do not have a cyborg, which I personally don't like, but whatever, I'll get into that later. Your opponents throughout the tournament will be people from clubs in this game. The leaders don't appear in the tournament though. However, a certain somebody might pop up as a finalist every now and then. Oh my god, bro. Ronald will always pop up when you enter the tournament at this point of the game. He's aiming for the Mewtwo as well. And if you lose here, you lose your chance to get Mewtwo for now. This deck is also the deck he'll be using every time you see him in tournament. Ronald's deck starts to lean more into the bigger basic Pokemon this time around. He uses big basics alongside Grimer and Muck to stall and negate your abilities. He's also the first opponent to use Gust of Wind and energy removals. Gust of Wind is one of the most infamous cards in history. It simply forces your opponent to switch their active Pokemon with one of the Pokemon on their bench of your choosing. You use a card like this to prevent the opponent from setting up a powerful Pokemon or or you could just drag out a weak Pokemon and kill it. This Douglet bitch is one of the best fire cards in the game. I've had this card in my deck since the last gym, but I didn't want to talk about it until now. It can take out multiple cards in the game through sheer luck alone. The second attack has a chance to inflict poison, and you've seen how that could go with the last few cards. The first attack is the reason why it's one of the best cards to store with in the game. It does 10 damage for wind energy, and it forces the opponent to flip a coin right before they do their move. If they're successful, they can do it. But Tails, it fails, no matter what it is. Scyther will rob your prizes blind at the worst times possible. It's one of the bigger basics sporting 70 HP. Now, its main attack is not impressive. It just does 30 for 3. But the first move makes this card go crazy. For one grass, it will do double the damage to the target on the next turn. So now the 30 jumps to 60. If he goes first and Swords Dance, on the next turn, he could just pop a DCE and knock out most cards in the game. More if he stacks a power plus on it. This card hits like a truck and it doesn't even have a retreat cost. I'm pretty sure they did this because this card winds up as hard as the boss in Elden Ring. So might as well give you the ability to pump fake it. With the gust of wind, you can find yourself in situations where a Pokemon you're setting up can get cleaved. With a series of lucky flips from Ninetales and Rapidash, I was able to come out on top and take home the promo Mewtwo. The water club is an indoor pool with a couple members waiting about. In the break room, there's a girl that's willing to trade a copy of Raging Arcanine for a Lapras. Lapras is rare and I didn't get a copy till the late game, so there goes any chance of playing with Kujo. Now most water cards tend to do one of two things. Having access to Water Gun, which can increase its own power depending on how many energies is on the card, and or having an attack that flips for paralysis. I think it's because Water also houses Ice-type Pokemon and moves as well, so this is their way of freezing Pokemon. Now, I can't hope to beat the Water Club with a Fire deck, so I had to change things up. I can either go with Thunder or Grass to have advantage over some Water cards, or just go neutral with any other type. I didn't have enough Thunder cards to justify the switch to that type. Another thing was that I didn't like the huge energy calls most of them have, and the cards I had to go neutral didn't scratch the creative itch I had. So I went with Grass. After seeing that Weedle Line, Coughing, and Weeping Bell, I was more interested in those cards than anything else. I tried to go to the leader, but this little shit got in my way. <laughs> The game starts with my Taurus versus her Lapras. She gets a bit of damage on my card, and I waited some turns to try and get some big damage with Rage, but they ended up confusing my card. Now I can't wait much longer with the status ailment. I had to take the 50-50 with attacking. If I failed this flip, I'd die, but luckily I didn't. War Turtle comes in, but it gets his back blown out by another successful Rage. On the following turn though, I couldn't hit it because it did withdraw. The Tortoise then puts these out and calls Mama Lapras. Not feeling lucky anymore, I tried to retreat, but I failed it. Thankfully, you don't take damage for attempting, but I did waste two energies. At this point, I felt like I couldn't really stall much longer, so I tried to take a chance and put a DCE on the Taurus to attack with Rage one last time. Yes, sir. Well, it was worth a shot. 
coughing is the next to go and man is the guaranteed status effect clutch. Unfortunately, they healed off the damage with a shitty ass potion. They also used removal on my coughing at the worst time possible. I got a bad case of mana drought. Thankfully, coughing so good it got a retreat cost of 1. The switch into the weedle and the poison on top was beautiful. Now I'm looking at a horsey that soon evolved into Seedra. This card has both water gun and agility, the move my Rapidash has. So it can deal a good chunk of damage if loaded up and sack you like crazy. I put out a bell sprout hoping I could draw weeping bell but the game was not letting me have that. Good thing I had Gust of Wind to pull out that bitch ass turtle. Some turns pass and she's able to get a Blastoise out. This is the ace card of her deck. Blastoise gives her the ability to play as many water energies as she wants on water cards. This is super fun, cause potentially every Pokemon she has can be loaded up immediately. It's 3 to 3 now. This game is way too close for comfort, because I'm running low on grass energies. I gust the fish back into the fight and pull out the secret weapon, Lickitung. With 90 HP and an attack that has a chance to paralyze for 10 damage, it's one of the best cards to stall with. I just need this big boy to stall while I load up the weeping bell in the back. Getting the paralysis on a turn helped out a lot. I swapped it out for Taco Bell here and knocked out the Seedra just like that. It's 1-3 to three and surely I had this in the bag. Until I realized she put 5 energies on the Blastoise. Stop, please. Don't hit me with water. Bitch started to hit for 60 damage. I don't have enough grass energies left in the deck to load another Weeping Bell, so I had to roll the die on getting the poison status on it and stalling with Lickitung. Bad poison. Yes, bad poison. <laughs> the poison sealed her fate. Easily one of the best matches I had in the game. Special shout out to Camden Gibson, Lunif, Meeting Juvie, and Goopley. Without any of the supporters right now, I would not have After Effects to do all the things I'm doing in this video. Lightning cards usually have an effect that inflicts paralysis, like half of the water cards. What sets them apart from water is the theme of several cards within the color having attacks that can snipe the bench. Either a card would do damage to the Pokemon and the bench, or hit only a card or cards on the bench. Most lightning cards that do damage by sniping the bench need ridiculous amounts of energy to do their moves. Now, originally, the way that you would load up the snipers was with Electrode. This card had a very interesting ability that allowed it to knock itself out out and attach it to another Pokemon. Once attached, it counts as two energy of your choosing. It granted insane energy acceleration and is a cornerstone in a variety of decks that rely on costly attacks like Charizard and Zapdos. The drawback is of course the fact that your opponent gets a prize card since the Electro knocked itself out. There are some other risks when playing this card as well, but that has more to do with other cards around the time being incredibly stupid and not the fault of the card itself. Something to note is that the card is not in the game at all, despite being in the base set. I guess with an effect as wonky as this, they probably couldn't find a way to implement it properly without running into some bugs. They replaced it with another card that was exclusive to the game until they released it physically in a pack years later. And it's okay? The first attack deals 30 for 2, which is fine, and it also isn't affected by resistance eater, which is pretty good, but it also can't hit for extra damage for hitting the weakness, which is stupid. The second move could have been really good energy acceleration, but the cost for it is absolute dog water. At least do some damage. I feel like this card was rushed out just for this game. Is the lightning club in some kind of dance hall? I'm, I'm not exactly sure. You're supposed to wait for the lights to come back on, so you play the people around here to pass the time. There's also a trainer that's trading a promo Electabuzz for a regular Electabuzz, which is the biggest scam in this game. This is the equivalent of trading the kid with the haunter that had an Everstone on it. Fuck you! 
up. So Promo Electabuzz has 60 HP. The first move is Light Screen. It can half the damage it will take next turn. The second move is a coin flip move that does 20 damage for tails, 30 for heads. It's okay all things considered. However, Base Set Electabuzz is probably one of the best cards in the game. 70 HP, standard 1 energy attack for 10 damage and a flip effect for a paralysis, and an attack that does 30 damage for 2 energies and a flip effect to do 10 more damage on top of that. This card is incredibly overtuned. It seems like they tried to balance the card by making it do damage to itself if you fail to flip, but this card gets more damage consistently than any other card in this game for just 2 energies. The Lightning Leader focuses on Magnemite does 40 damage to itself and the target. It also inflicts 10 damage to both players' benches. Magneton does the same thing, except it's 80 damage instead of 40, and it does 20 damage to both benches. Now, if he knocks out a Pokemon this way, both players get a prize. But if he uses Defender, the little one can live through the attack. Magneton would need two defenders to make it out alive because his HP is piss poor. Since these magnets do damage to the bench, he could combo it with Tauros to try and get some extra damage for rage. The strategy itself is mid, but Electabuzz is so ridiculous that the whole game can shift in momentum once it pops up. I had to stall with the Clefairy doll at some point just to adjust myself properly to fight it off. Oh well, ain't no God. fucking way, bro. Yeah, after you get the fifth medal, you have to face off against Ronald again. He starts to gloat about the fact that he already down six clubs in the same way Gary talks about his 10 badges. I know one of them's that fighting gym that went out of commission. What's the other three for? Ronald's new deck tells me flat out that the devs knew what the best cards in the TCG was. They legit gave him a baby haymaker deck. It's basically just a good stuff.exe deck. The logic is to use big basics that have little energy costs and deal decent damage consistent. Since most of these cards require little investment energy wise and deck wise, you can easily fit multiple basics of different types and cover multiple matchups. The deck gets its name Haymaker from a boxer Pokemon Hitmonchan. For just one energy it does 20 damage. This combined with the fact that it has 70 HP makes it so that it could take a beating while also rushing you down quickly for 20 each turn. If enough time passes he may have 3 energies on it to deal 40 damage. Mewtwo, Tauros, Electabuzz are back and they're ready to just be pains in the ass for you. Mr. Mind stands out a lot when compared to the other big basics because it doesn't have a lot of HP, but don't let that fool you. It has an ability that prevents itself from getting damaged by any attack that does 30 damage. This is busted because most good cards do about that amount of damage. Not to mention the fact that you can be locked out of a win condition if you're stuck with bigger damage Pokemon. Its attack is nothing to scoff at either, doing 10 damage plus another 10 for each damage counter on the target. Combined with defenders and he has a Pokemon that can stall and dish out big damage. This big bitch got 90 HP. It would take even the best Pokemon 3 to 4 hits just to down it. For 2 energy, you could take a chance to flip a coin to inflict confusion. It doesn't do damage so it's not worth a damn. For 1 energy, it deals 10 damage and flips for paralysis. It doesn't seem too crazy at first. Plenty of other Pokemon can do this too, so how come they don't get as much gas as Lickitung? Well, remember, it will probably take 3 to 4 hits just to KO this card. Let's say you need 4. At that point, there is a high likelihood that you got paralyzed twice or more. Having that much life grants it more opportunities to stall more than most other cards in the game. I have this card in my deck and I can assure you there have been many times that I knocked out a Pokemon just by stalling with Legaton. The devs were very aware how stupid this card was cause several opponents in this game have this card. Combine all these good cards with some of the best trainer cards and he's probably the most difficult opponent to fight in the game at this point. Only one problem, for some reason he doesn't have a single trainer card that draws cards. Besides Gambler, but he only has one and if it fails, this makes his deck incredibly inconsistent. Sometimes he'll beat your ass, other times he just eats shit. I guess he would have been overtuned if he also had Oaks and Bills. They gave him a Kangaskhan which has a move that allows him to draw one card. But it's only one card and the card itself is a sitting duck. It was really fun to fight Ronald and his baby haymaker deck.
Psychic cards are a bit weird and hard to pinpoint what their theme is. A lot tend to have attacks that inflict either confusion or sleep. The ones with abilities often have one that plays around with the idea of placing and moving damage around different cards. A lot of the effects are unique to the type as well, such as Destiny Bond, which KOs the Pokemon that KOs the user, and Card Recovery. Some Psychic cards pay a cost to recover cards in the discard pile, most notably Ghastly. This is the only card I know of that can recover DCE from the discard pile, which is mighty impressive. The Psychic Club itself is just filled with the sweatiest people in the game. One of them looks kind of familiar though. None of them will give you the time of day unless you have medals to show your worth. One of them won't play you unless you have a medal, and the other will only accept your challenge if you have two medals. Even if you beat both, the leader will not battle you unless you have four medals. There's also this guy in the club that can't stand the members in it and is willing to part ways with a Mewtwo if you could beat the leader. <laughs> Sounds like a skill issue to me. The leader's deck main win condition is to deck you out. He has some of the best cards to stall with too, like Chansey and Mime. He runs several copies of Kangaskhan and Snorlax. The point of these two cards being in the deck is to combo them with Alakazam. With this card's ability, he can move the damage on one Pokemon to another Pokemon as long as he doesn't knock out the Pokemon that's taking the new damage counters. So if a Snorlax has 70 health, he can't move the 70 damage to say Electabuzz. He can move 60 to the Electabuzz and the leftovers to another Pokemon. That way the Snorlax is healed up and the target is now in kill range in case he needs to swap the Wing Kong gears. Because he doesn't have much priority on attacking, he also has multiple copies of Pokemon Center and Scoopa. The Center heals all cards that lost health to full health but discards all the energies attached. Since he's not really aiming to attack, it doesn't doesn't matter if he loses energies. Scoopa places a basic Pokemon into his hand and discards any cards attached to it, like its evolutions and energies. Most of the cards in his deck are basics, so he won't be discarding any Pokemon this way. With cards like Gust and Removal, he can control the flow of the game in his favor. Now the funny thing about his stall deck is that he can just deck himself out instead. In my game with him, I didn't even know what the point of his deck was until I noticed I had less than 15 cards left in my deck. I took enough prizes in time to not deck out, and had I known what was going on, I could have stalled him out instead, cause dude only had 10 cards left versus my 8. Rock and ground type Pokemon in this game tend to have effects that give themselves protection in some way. Leer, Harden, Sand Attack, etc. Now, most of them resist lightning, but Onyx and Geodude don't? You hear what you're saying out loud, bro? I heard they make the cards gain resistance depending on the card's primary typing in the mainline games, but that doesn't really hold water since the design point is not consistent with several other cards. It's very odd to play a game where that Electabuzz could beat the dog shit out of Golem. Not much is going on in the club compared to others. You don't even have to fight the members to fight the leader. You can just walk straight up towards them. It's pretty evident that this was a club you're probably expected to do early. Like how the Rock Gym is the first gym in the mainline games. I'll be quick and brief about this guy. He sucks. I think his deck is supposed to stall with cards that use Leer and Harden to build up the bench, but because every Pokemon he has needs an extreme amount of energy to do anything, it's unreasonable to stall that long and set up everything. He might get one Duck Trio set up, but that takes four turns of stalling. He's gonna need another four turns just to set up another one. Not to mention the fact that the Dug Trio damages his bench for 10 damage each time it does Earthquake. The Fighting Club is the last thing between me and my destiny. Fighting type Pokemon most of the time have cheap attack costs and do fast and consistent damage. They share the color with Rock and Ground, so most decks with this color will have a good mix of offense and defense. But since this is a Fighting Club, it's full offense. Do you remember all the way back what happened when I first walked in here? He wouldn't battle me unless I fought his pupils. Well, throughout the game, I saw them spread throughout different clubs, but I didn't attempt to battle two of them. At the start of the game, when I first entered the grass club, I came across Michael. I thought that I might as well get him out the way so I don't have to backtrack to the club later. And he walked me out like a dog. He literally just has a baby haymaker deck. 
Magmar, Electabuzz, Hitmonchan, Genghis Khan. It's almost Ronald's deck one for one. They just slapped in some prime apes and called it a day. Because of that experience, I avoided any confrontation with any of the members until I had better cards. Now at this point in the game, I stood a way better chance at beating the members of this club. But do I stand a chance against the leader? Now Mitch can rob a game fast from you because of the nature of fighting type Pokemon. Machop is one of the few cards that could do 20 damage in the entire game for one energy along with Hitmonchan. Also star you for some reason? Off the top of my head, I can only think of four basic cards that can do that and if I'm missing one, I'll edit them in. Mankeys have the ability to peek at a prize, making it easier for him to pick the right ones. Although, I think the CPU already knows which cards are which anyways. A saving grace in this matchup is the awfully slow evolutions. See, I guess to balance out the Machop being able to do 20 damage on top of having a beefy 50 HP, they gave his evolutions humongous energy costs. Machoke not only needs 3-4 to four energies to do anything, but it also has this garbage attack. I think Karate Chop might be the only move in the game that gets weaker. The more damage the card takes, the weaker the move gets. So if it took 40 damage, it'll only do 10 damage. Now it does have another attack, but it damages itself for 20 if he uses it. He has several potions and defenders to offset these negatives at the very least. <laughs> Machamp is the real ace. It still has a very unattractive energy cost, but with plus power, this thing can knock out most cards in the game. It also has an ability that inflicts 10 damage to any card that hits it, so he might not even need the plus power to knock out a card. Bruce Lee here has been a thorn in my side for the entire game. Several other trainers had this card too, and for good reason. For 2 energies, it can stretch its legs to snipe a Pokemon on the bench for 20. I found myself often in position scrambling to evolve my Pokemon before he snipes my cards away. Now, the one drawback about the cards that hit fast and hard is that they can never hit as hard as most evolution cards in the game. And since he doesn't have enough trainers like removal to control my momentum, my damage output and effects start to outpace him. The final medal is finally obtained. I now have the right to go to the Tokyo Dome and fight the Grandmasters. Okay, <laughs> not the Tokyo Dome, but come on, it, it's damn near it. Before I set my sights towards the end game, I wanted to finally see if I have the cards necessary to pull this off. First things first, the extra packs. Each time you get a medal, you get an email from the doctor. I have no idea why he's emailing you when he's right there, but whatever. And the emails are tips and tricks about the leaders in the game, which could help you out a lot if you're brand new to the trading card game. The main draw is the packs. Each email has a free pack attached to it, with some having two. I've been going through the whole game without rematching anyone. I wanted to see how beatable the game was without grinding. However, because of this, I realized that for some reason, getting extra oaks without much grinding is a nightmare. I only had one throughout my entire playthrough, so you can imagine the number of times I was close to having dead hands. Fortunately, at some point I got two copies of Item Finder, which lets you trade two cards in your hand for a trainer in the discard pile. With these, I'm able to cut down on some trainers since the discard pile essentially becomes a toolbox with this card in the deck. With some luck, I was able to get some more oaks and a Charizard. If only I still had that Charizard I pulled in real life. <sighs> Damn. But it's okay, because pulling it in the game makes it easier for me to enact my Grandmaster plan. My goal with this game was to make a decent Charizard deck. It don't gotta be meta, it just gotta be good enough to beat this game convincingly enough to gas it up. Now Charizard can change any energy attached to it to fire energies. So the logic is to put two DCEs on it and attack. And with the Ghastly I spoke about earlier, I could recover the DCE back. The problem is that I mistook how the attack works. The way this attack is worded is in a way where that instead of discarding just a DCE that counts as two fire energies, it wants me to discard two energy cards full stop. Meaning I have to discard both DCE cards in order to use this attack. It's no problem, I could still attach a DCE to Charizard and then two fire energies. When Charizard is in KO range, I'll attach the second DCE as a last effort attack. Then, if Charizard dies, I put the Ghastly in afterwards to get the DCE back and repeat. This may look slow, but because Charizard has amazing HP, I can afford to take some extra time to set it up. The Ghastly also has Lick, which has a chance to paralyze. Throwing the Haymaker Magmars to stall in poison, and voila. The biggest plus to this deck is the fact that you can KO 3-4 to four Pokemon with 
ease once the Charizard is loaded up. The downside is not only loading up the Charizard, but also once the Charizard is going, you cannot put energies on anyone else. You have to be locked into that Charizard and putting energies on it to replace the energies you discarded, which means you can't set up another card while you're attacking with Charizard. Once that Charizard dies, you probably either lost or hopefully you could use the gas to get a DCE and set up another Charizard and get it going. But that's about it. Now, in my version of the deck in this game, I don't have nearly enough cards to make that a reality, especially the fact that I'm missing the best card for the deck, Pokemon Breeder. Without this, I must slowly evolve every Charizard from Charmeleon instead of making a Charmander jump straight to Charizard in one turn. No use crying over it though. It's time for the end game. Who dares to enter the main versus All or nothing. The last thing I want to bring up is the statement I had at the start of the video. I think the early beginning of the Pokemon TCG is 10 times more interesting than early Yu-Gi-Oh. And I don't even think that's debatable. I came into this thinking that the early sets and cards were going to be janky, boring pile of shit. What ended up happening is that I came out of this in love with the amount of care they have for the game in the early stages. It's very evident how much effort they put into the design of these cards just by seeing the huge number of benchmarks they had across the game. If I was to point out all the design choices I noticed, this would legit be another 30 minutes of me trying to explain just half of it. The point is, I can see that a lot of the reasoning they had with designing certain cards without even coming out to say anything. With the early Yu-Gi-Oh cards, barely anything was made with much rhyme or reason. The game was made to capitalize on the Yu-Gi-Oh manga's pivot to making the power system a card game. In the manga, it ended up being the perfect narrative tool that Takahashi landed on to push the story forward and avoid being axed altogether by Shonen Jump. Not to say that the manga was on its way to getting axed, but at the time as an author, if you happen upon something that your readers took a liking to, you're going to do whatever you can to please them while also making the story work for you. Editorial and the reader's letters was bugging him about the concept of the game ever since its offshoot introduction in a few chapters. No way you're gonna let that slip. What I'm getting at is that the card game didn't have much intention behind it at its inception because it was a spur of the moment kind of thing. A lot of the early Yu-Gi-Oh cards resembled that. There was a huge abundance of terrible vanilla cards. Hell, even the rules in the OCG were not well thought out. And when the rule change happened, certain cards like the 5-star vanilla monsters became much more worthless since you had to tribute a monster to summon a card with less stats than La Jin. That is not the case for Pokemon. See, the development of Pokemon Red and Green lasted 6 years. This is the game they were slowly building up and making since 1990. While making Red and Green, around the start of 1995, the concept of the Pokemon card game started to surface. Throughout all of 95 and 96, constant playtesting and balance changes were being made. And let me tell you, the beta Pokemon cards are a sight to behold. Oh my god. What is Version 0 card art was made by the legendary Oyama. He's one of the people credited with making the Pokemon TCG along with Takumi Akabane and Sunikasu Ishihara. Coincidentally, they all made a mark in the industry with this cult classic. Before the company was called Creatures Inc., it was Ape Inc. Creatures is the successor to Ape Inc. after falling on some hard times. A lot of the former employees were absorbed into Creature Inks in some way or another. Oddly enough, a lot of them ended up in very high positions within the company likely because they've been there since the start. Akabane was the research and development director at Creatures. But before that, one of the notable things he has credit for is being the chief debugger of Earthbound. Ishihara was one of the producers of Earthbound alongside Itoi and Iwata. With the fall of Ape Inc, Ishihara founded the new company, Creatures Inc, with the help of Iwata. Ishihara would later be succeeded by one of the composers of Earthbound, Hirokazu Tanaka. A niche amount of people may know him as Hip slash Chip Tanaka. Uyama was the art director, graphic designer, and game designer of Earthbound. Even though he doesn't have a high position in the company per se, or at least as far as I know, his work has inspired a multitude of people and game designers across the whole world. Crazy that some of the most influential people within the industry 
are the backbone of the Pokemon TCG. Going back on track, Ishihara was one of the three credited earlier that initiated the creation of the Pokemon TCG. Although those three are credited with the creation of the game, I doubt they were the only ones within the company actively involved with the design and balance of it all. Now, let's look at Uyama's beta cards at the starting point. Notice something odd about this Chansey? This 4th gen slow health bar ass Pokemon has 140 HP. The version we ended up with has 120. I can't believe at some point this card was stronger than it was. Some cards stayed the same throughout the changes while others went through dramatic nerfs and buffs. And it took a while for the stats to be final. They were flippant on some of the decisions and adamant about others. Charmeleon basically stayed the same throughout the whole testing phase besides the Koro Koro scans. Chansey is one of the cards that they were very flippant with probably because it skirted far and away from the usual benchmarks in favor of having flavor. Chansey in the mainline games has a huge amount of HP. So they felt Chansey in the card game should skirt around some of the benchmarks they had to avoid having so much of a disconnect between the two games. Several other basic Pokemon kind of go under this umbrella as well. You can see that they were very adamant about keeping certain benchmarks from the start. For example, all the basic Pokemon with 30 HP have zero retreat costs. Because they have lower HP than average, they gave these cards bigger benefits than the average 40 HP basics. Rattata can do 20 damage, Diglett can do 30 without a drawback, Ghastly has Destiny Bond, which has the potential to knock out any target with full HP if you're a fucking moron that's willing to walk into it. It could be said that the version 0 to 3 cards was all the work they did in 1995. Version 4 is where things start to get a bit weird. For starters, the art is no longer just the art from Uyama and Ken Sugimori. In fact, most of the art from Sugimori was just renders made for red and green that they kind of used as placeholders for most of 95. At the start of 96 was when they hired a freelance artist, Mitsuhiro Arita most known for being the illustrator of one of the most sought after Pokemon cards in TCG history. Arita was invited to be on board with the project by Keji Kinibuchi. All the cards with the early 3D Macintosh look were made by this guy. Now, they never went on record to say what time each version of these cards were made in, but it's easy to assume that version 4 was made at the start of 96 because the cards start to feature artwork from Arita. The version 4 era is what I've referred to as the Koro Koro era. These were cards that were scanned and featured in the Koro Koro magazines. What's weird about the Koro Koro cards is the fact that the card power was so insane, I'm inclined to believe that this was a different game altogether being tested side by side to see which version of the game was more manageable. Look at this chunky rat. Remember way back how I said Pikachu can rob a prize if the owner goes first? Well, this Pikachu can just win you the whole game because it can do 50 damage for two energies. This version of Pikachu shits on most cards in the final product. That's why I think it was a part of a completely different set of cards that they were working on side by side. This Pikachu is so good, it's literally better than the Raichu they show in the same magazine. Four energies for 60 damage? Yeah, I Look at this Mewtwo. Went from 70 HP to 100. Also, the Psychic Attack starts at 20 and not 10. The Koro Koro game was cracked across the board. Now, another possibility is the fact that they pumped up the numbers on the cards to make them look more attractive in the magazine. Cause you know, kids and investors love bigger numbers, so why not fake some of the stats to make things look more attractive? In fact, now that I think about it, that might have been the case most likely since they juiced up the mascot so much. Later in the year, Pokemon Red and Green came out in February of 1996, and the Pokemon TCG came out in October 1996. Even before the information about the beta cards became public knowledge, just by sitting down and looking at most of these cards from base set to jungle showed me that there was so much effort put into the design of every card in these sets when compared to Yu-Gi-Oh. Despite all that, I have to say that they fucked up pretty bad with a few things. They put so much energy into trying to balance the Pokemon individually as cards that I don't think they put the same amount of effort into the trainer cards. The way they balanced their trainers was as if the focus was on how they interact with Pokemon and not how they interact with other trainer cards. Check out this Magneton for example. A lot of people give a shit for being the worst card, but why? It can do 30 damage with a chance to paralyze, and if low on health, it can explode and take out a Pokemon with full health. 
Hell, I bet money they thought that people would use self-destruct in combination with Gust of Wind. Maybe in the Koro Koro timeline that would have went crazy. With this, I'm not saying the card is amazing, but it's probably like a low B, right? Well, when you factor in that someone can use Pokemon Trader to switch a card for Hitmonchan, play it on the board, give it an energy, use computer search to discard energy removal and plus power, search for an oak, draw 7 cards, use item finder since they just drew it, grab energy removal to prevent the magneton to self destruct or plus power to outright kill it, you start to see why the magneton might suck. It's not because the card inherently is bad, it's because the game has so many cards to filter through the deck and find the right silver bullets. These trainers were created and designed to make it easier to get the key combo pieces, but instead they made it easier to filter through the deck to get disruption. Even with all that, Magneton could have been a low C card, but the existence of energy removal makes it complete ass. Energy removal ruins the playability of this era for me. This card invalidates so many decks, it's not even funny. It allows the most boring deck in the format to be the best, Stall. Essentially, all this deck does is stall with Chansey, Lickitung, and Moltres. Moltres is there to get around the fighting type weakness and for the main win con. It can mill cards from the top of the opponent's deck depending on the amount of energies you discard from it. Throw in Scythers and Mewtwo as a plan B card, and you have the best deck and it's not even close. It really gets most of its mileage by using item finders to reuse removals. If removal wasn't a card, this deck would be a lot more beatable. I might be a bit biased with my hate towards removal, so I'll say from another perspective that I think the real problem cards might be Computer Search and Item Finder, just because they're able to search these cards and reuse these cards, whereas having removals in the deck by itself, you have to hard draw it. Now someone at this point may be thinking, well if they've been testing this game for a year plus, how did they not know that the trainer cards were overtuned? Two things. Number one, the creators probably did not know how to play their own game optimally. Not saying that as a diss, but I'm pretty sure most games in general, you don't really know what's good until tournament results start to show a pattern. Hell, the first few tournaments of the Pokemon TCG had decks that were topping that had no business topping at all. Gyarados with four water energies and a nine tails with four fire energies? This shit look nasty as fuck! The second thing is that they were working on so much shit on the side that I doubt they even had the time to test the game to an optimal level. Not only was the guys at Game Freak still working on Red and Green while Creatures was working on the card game, both parties also have to deal with marketing, advertising, investors, event planning, and localization. Mind you, this is at a time where the teams between the two companies were probably no bigger than 20? So of course a few things will fall through the cracks of balance. Hell, they even realized that some of the cards were a bit bunk soon after. At a tournament they organized around the fourth set, computer search was illegal along with several disruption cards being limited. The people working on the game have said on record that they study other tabletop games around the world. Hell, Akabane has pictures of older magic sets that he owns. At the end of the day, they had a really good understanding on what makes a card game tick. Better than the guys at Konami in the early days, and maybe even the god Takahashi himself. It's no competition though. All parties involved have made amazing card games that stuck it through the test of time. Approaching the tour, someone yells out that you can only walk into the Grand Hall if you have 8 medals. <laughs> Without even checking in person, they somehow know you have all 8. A man named Rod... I'm sorry, Rod? <laughs> what's, what's with this ordinary ass name? Anyways, he calls out and says to enter the stage. Once you enter it, you can't leave until you beat everyone there or lose. Any fan of the mainline games know this is the game's version of the Elite Four. You have to fight every member back to back. In between games, you're allowed to change up your deck, which is a lot more lenient than even the mainline games. Each Grandmaster has the legendary card that their deck is built around. Now, three of them are not real cards. These cards are specifically made for this game. I didn't know this coming into this, but it makes sense because the effects they have are a bit absurd. 
The first Grandmaster to face is Courtney the Fire Queen. She's the reason why every fire trainer after her is in the same spot on the color wheel. Her deck has cards you should be very familiar with at this point since I had them in my fire deck. Nine Tails, Rapidash, and Magmar. Her deck makes my life way easier because I don't have to write about her cards. But she does have two fire cards I didn't have. Moltres. She has two versions of the rubber chicken, the real one and the fake one. The fake one is actually the legendary one. <laughs> the real one is the one we got in real life. This Moltres is infamous for giving stall decks their win condition. It could discard any amount of energies attached to it and mill cards from the opponent's deck equal to the amount of energies discarded. With 70 HP and no weakness, this card is bound to stick around for a while. Its second attack is kinda ass though. You flip for a chance to hit or miss with 70 damage, which is incredible incredibly dumb, but I get it because 70 damage is enough to knock out 90% of the cards in this game. The second Moltres has much higher HP and an attack that's a bit cheaper but still has the same effect as the last one. What makes this one decent is the ability to search for fire energies when it's played from the hand. It's a really good effect when you consider the fact that there are no cards that search for multiple fire energies that easily. There is a card that can search for a energy, but just one, not multiple. It does have a slight problem. It's random. She gets to add energies to her hand, but it's a random amount between 1 to 4. It's literally a Hearthstone card. No wonder it never got printed, cause how would you even determine this in real life? I guess you roll 4 dies and add a card for each result that's even? <sighs> It's not too cumbersome. Ideally, you would think that one bird would search for the fire cards, and then she attaches them to the other bird to mill your deck out. But her deck doesn't really aim for that. Either they didn't want to give her a win con that most players hate, or they couldn't program the AI to prioritize decking you out over winning more prizes. Now, her card's energy requirements are... Fuck to the no, bro. But I break so bad. I had to stall like crazy with Magmar and Ghastly while trying to set up the Charmander. She easily got two prizes off me. But once I finally had the Fraudazard, I stole four prizes with ease. The Thundermaster has some of the suspects you would expect in a Thunder deck. On top of those guys, he also has Jolteon. But the card is very flip reliant. In fact, the whole deck is reliant on luck. This Zapdos does 40 damage to the active Pokemon, and then you flip a coin for each Pokemon on the opponent's bench. The Pokemon that got the winning results get 20 damage, but for each time you get Tails, you lose 10 damage. That means if they have 4 Pokemon on the bench and I get Tails 4 times, I lose 40 damage. It's an interesting card at the least, but its cost is way too high to be a threat even in the late game, since most cards would have evolved by then and have way more health overall. Plus, it hurts itself each time it fails, so it could possibly put itself in KO range just from one attack. The other Zapdos is a card that the game gives you at the start of the game, but just by looking at it, you can tell this rarely sees the light of day. Now both of these birds are underwhelming, but he can stall with them since they have a humongous amount of HP. This way he can load up cards in the back at the price of a prize card. Using cards like Gus easily disrupts the plan though. The best card in this deck is easily the fake Zapdos. See, whenever it's played from the hand, it does 30 damage to a random card excluding Zapdos. So best case scenario. If he plays multiple copies early, he can knock out several Pokemon without attacking. Worst case scenario, he knocks out his own cards. <laughs> it also has an attack that hits a random card for 70 damage? This card's more Hearthstone than the last one. If this is a real card, it would be a nightmare to try and determine what gets hit randomly. Do you assign a number to every card and then roll the die to see which number it gets? What a goofy ass card. No wonder they never printed it. Grandmaster Jack easily has the best deck so far. Not only is he the first to have multiple consistency boosters like Oak and Trader, but he also has big beefy cards to stall with little cost. Chansey and Lapras here are as bad as ever. Seal and Dugong are just as massive, with Seal having 60 HP and Dugong having attacks that'll blow your back out for a price. This version of Articuno tends to be the ace card in multiple rain dance decks. A 3 cost that does 30 damage with a chance to paralyze, and a 4 cost that does 50 damage with a chance to do 10 damage to either bench depending on the coin flip. The cold turkey has 70 HP though, which is a lot but not nearly as big as Big Bird. 
It's very possible for him to load up these cards better than the Lightning Grandmaster, because for starters, the cards he has to stall with are much better than the Lightning Grandmaster's cards. Also, the fake Arakuno has the best ability that allows him to stall more. If played from the hand, it flips for a chance to paralyze your card. That's it. All the other stupid birds have all this RNG nonsense, and Articuno's just like, nah, just flip for a chance to break their back. This actually could have been a real card. Its main attack is a bit reliant on RNG, since it hits a random target for 40 damage, but at least it only hits an opponent's cards and not his own. With 4 copies of Scoop Up, he could do this ability again and again, turn after turn. I had a lot of difficulty with him, not only because of the theme of his deck, but because my deck is weak to water. I had a lot of close calls in this fight, and I had to rely on some luck to pull through. But once the fraud was loaded up, curtains. Finally, the final member. <laughs> Rock. I can't even say his name seriously. Yeah, see, uh, I got unlucky with my hand, and since he started with Lapras versus my Magmar, I, I just lost. Luckily, I saved right before the fight. Rod is the Dragon Master with a deck that mirrors Lance's team in the mainline games. His legendary card isn't a bird, but instead, Dragonite. Of the four legendary cards in this game, this is the only card that was printed physically. You get a copy of it by buying the game brand new in Japan. But this Dragonite never came to the west though. Instead, we got a copy of this shitty Meowth with the game. I have no idea why they did such a devious switch up. The Dragonite is okay. If played from the hand, it could heal a Pokemon for 20. But this card is a stage 2 Pokemon. You should be healing for more than just 20. Potion already does that. Dragonite needs 3 cards in order to heal heal for 20? What? <laughs> it takes several turns to make it. Now that aside, I really can't gas up his deck. Even though he's the leader, I think he's the worst out of the three. Scratch that, he might be one of the worst boss battles in the game. Several cards in this deck demand huge amounts of energy and time to evolve. The only card worth mentioning is the Dragonair. With Hyper Beam, it could discard the energy off the target, which sounds crazy good. Unfortunately, it has a terrible energy cost. Also, the damage you get for 4 energy is abysmal. He can give it double DCE and start attacking with it immediately at the least, but he only has 4 of them in the deck. Unless the deck is specialized to get them back after losing them, this attack won't last long. It's Hyper Beam, one of the strongest moves at the time in the games. You would think it would be doing more damage, but I guess they thought it would be overkill if it did more than it already does. But why even call this move Hyper Hyper Beam, just give it a different name. Rod's a fraud, and I can't believe I lost to him on the first try. And that's it for the Pokemon TCG for the Game Boy. It was a long journey, but... Where the fuck you even come from, bitch? Yeah, come on, man. You already know how these games get down. Ronald Bing came through and got the cards for himself. Apparently, he wasn't supposed to take the cards yet, since I have the right to have them too. But he don't care, he decides to use them against us in our final battle. Winner takes all. I can't lie to you, there's no way to gas this up, because he sucks more than the last guy. He's worse than most club members in the game. Look at this deck and tell me if it can do anything. This deck literally looks like the deck you start the game with. Look at this. It's a fucking mess. The evolutions all have colorless attacks, so at least he can attack with them. But there are so many dead stage 1 and 2 cards in the deck, and since he only has one oak, he just sits on his deck doing nothing between turns. Ronald's last few decks are 10 times better than this mess. What a weird last boss. But maybe that's the point for the narrative. Ronald was so hungry for the power that he didn't care if he could use it properly. His past decks had a lot of intent in what he wanted to do. The contents of those decks are realistically good enough to get every medal in the game. Hell, you could beat the game with Ronald's past decks. Yet, in crafting this one, he discarded all deck building logic, driven solely by the compulsion to house every legendary card in it. And I think that's the point. I think the narrative unfolds not only a lesson for Ronald, but a lesson to all players. No matter the allure of individual cards, you can't just cram every single good card into a single deck. Ignore the existence of Haymaker right now, I'm trying to make a point. True deck building mastery lies in focusing on 2-3 to three cards unwavering in that commitment, any more or less, and you lose sight of the method. 
It's a bit weird to make the final boss such a pushover for this narrative, and for all I know, I could be talking out of my ass. Yet, with how his last few decks were all different versions of Haymaker, I'm inclined to think that this is the narrative that they wanted to get across to the player. And that's the end of the game. You walk into the Hall of Fame soon after the battle and obtain the four legendary cards. Wait, they just give you a whole ass Dragonite without Dragonair or Dratini? Wait, what the fuck is this all about? If you walk to the back of the room, you can actually interact with the computer in there. It could build a deck for you with a theme around the cards you just got. If you own the cards for the recipe, that is. Although one of these decks need promo Venusaur, which you can't even get in the game legally, so... You uh... tripping, bro! You tripping! Who dares to enter the mayhem versus... All or nothing. In the beginning of the video, I talked about the fact that I feel like the Pokemon TCG should be a lot bigger than it is. So for this segment, I'm going to talk about something that I feel like has been preventing the Pokemon TCG from being as big as it should be. Now something to acknowledge before I get into this is the fact that the casual audience of Pokemon is much larger than the competitive side. So collecting the cards and playing the games on a casual level will always be much more visible than the competitive side of things. With that being said, I think one of the biggest things that prevents the Pokemon TCG from getting any bigger is YouTube. The visibility for the Pokemon TCG competitively on YouTube is non-existent practically. This man trying to act like he don't see me. I'm not saying that the Pokemon company doesn't really do a good job at promoting the game. They could do better, but on their bucket list on things that will make them the most money, that's probably the lowest on the list for them. Visibility has been a problem for multiple forms of competitive Pokemon, from VGC to singles to the trading card game. And I think it's because the amount of casual content used to way outnumber the amount of competitive content. So in the very beginning, it was mostly people's playthroughs of Diamond and Pearl, along with various other older Pokemon games. This is around the time where people didn't even have capture cards for their DS. They would take the camera and put it over the DS. At this point, there was multiple official tournaments of the Pokemon TCG and VGC, but the amount of casual content overshadowed the press around it. Now, competitive Pokemon was in the shadow of casual content for a while until shoddy battle replays started to get pretty popular on YouTube. More Diamond and Pearl battle replays also started to show up on YouTube around this time. Because of these type of videos coming from early creators like Marilyn and Shofu, competitive Pokemon singles started to be recommended more often to people on their main pages. If you're a Pokemon fan, of course. If you're a Pokemon fan at the time, you probably came across those kind of videos without even knowing it. This is like the era of people using things like Ninjas to baton pass to a Magikarp to sweep a whole team and make a video out of it. With these videos becoming popular, it put a spotlight on competitive single Pokemon battles. Now, all of this was happening the whole time. It's just there wasn't that much spotlight on it until these type of videos were made. The other thing is that competitive singles didn't stay in the shadow too long in that era compared to other aspects of competitive Pokemon. This is where I bring up the VGC. Now, the video game competition for the Pokemon games have been around for a long time, but I don't think the average Pokemon fan was really aware this was a thing until X and Y. If you're a casual Pokemon enjoyer, the algorithm would have never pushed VGC content onto your timeline unless something big happened. Hell, even for me, I never got VGC content on my timeline at all back in the day. Even though I've been playing competitive singles for years, I've only became aware of VGC because of the most famous moment in VGC history with the Pachirisu. And I think that was the beginning of a lot of people's journey into the VGC lore around the X and Y era. But even during this time, VGC content didn't really take off. It wouldn't really be visible until channels like Weedle, Wolf, and Cybertrons started to take off in the algorithm. Some channels were blowing up during Sun and Moon, while others were blowing up during the Sword and Shield era. Competitive Pokemon singles have been in the shadow for a little bit, and VGZ has been in the shadow for eight years. Pokemon TCG is still in that shadow to this day. I'll show you what I mean, because I don't have any proof of those kind of things happening back in the day, but I kind of have some proof with that happening now with the Pokemon TCG. 
So these screenshots are from a couple months back, because unfortunately I've been working on this video for too long. Oh, what took you so long, idiot? At that time in Yu-Gi-Oh, Age of Overlord was the hot set at the time. If you searched up Yu-Gi-Oh! Age of Overlord, you would get a healthy mix of pack openings and people talking about the cards within the set, the metagame after the set, new engines that they can use in the old decks, and so forth. It was a healthy mix of casual and competitive content. Now, on the other side of things, when I simply put the Pokemon 151 set, instead of getting a healthy mix of competitive content and casual content, it was nothing but pack openings. I literally could not see anything else but pack openings. I had to be ultra specific about what I wanted to see when it came to competitive TCG content. Now, it wasn't like people weren't making thought pieces about the cards in the set and analysis like that. They were there, but YouTube did not want to show me them. I had to be very specific about who I wanted to see. Even with that, it was sometimes only show me one creator and not a multitude of creators. I ended up having to go to Reddit to find YouTube creators that talked about the Pokemon TCG competitively. That is insanely bad. If you search up anything with fighting games, you've probably seen these guys at some point. If you search up something with Yu-Gi-Oh, you've probably seen these guys. Hell, with Magic the Gathering, you've probably seen this person. But with Pokemon, I didn't get that. All I got was pack openings. I put Scarlet Violet Temporal Forces, which is the current set at the time of recording this. And first, I got pack openings. Then I put cards at the end, and I was still getting pack openings. Then I put set analysis, and I was still getting pack openings. And then the last two videos they showed before the people also watch section was set reviews, actual set reviews. This did not happen when I searched up the current set of Yu-Gi-Oh at all. And I'm pretty sure with other card games, it's the same thing. And I feel like it's mostly because the competitive side of those games pretty much is on the same level as the casual side of things. Whereas for Pokemon, the casual audience is just so huge that it's a detriment to the Pokemon TCG visibility. I know that's just my anecdotal experience, but if I had to go through that and I'm just an average Joe Smo, imagine what other people had to go through who were interested in playing the Pokemon TCG. So what? What does any of that have to do with player participation? Well, back in 2016 when VGC started to get hot, player participation for it started to go up and up and up. We're now at a point where there is as many people playing VGC as there is singles. I think the doubles and VGC creators that were growing at the time played the part in player participation within VGC. At one point in the Pokemon TCG, I feel like the player participation in it rose once a certain creator was making videos about the TCG. But when the world needed him most, he vanished. He didn't really vanish, he got better things to do. But another Jay Wits hasn't popped up, or at least to YouTube it hasn't. I think there's a couple of people that are probably just as good as him, it's just YouTube doesn't want to show you them. I later found out that by putting the set name and decks at the end of it, then you will see competitive Pokemon TCG creators. It's nothing too complicated, but with every other game, if you simply put the game's name, it will give you a variety of people. But with the Pokemon TCG, you definitely can't just put Pokemon, and you definitely can't put just Pokemon TCG. Crazy that if you put Pokemon VGC, you'll see a litany of VGC players, but if you put Pokemon TCG, you won't see an ounce of competitive TCG players. This whole side of YouTube is literally one word away. Now again, this is all super anecdotal, and most of the searching done here is done on someone else's account. It's crazy that with all these searches, I haven't seen Tricky Jim, Azul GG, Omnipoke, Dark Integral, which is someone I used to watch back in the X and Y days. I haven't seen any of these guys once in these screenshots and footage. I think I've seen Celio's network at some point, but that's about it. I really do hope that one day the Pokemon TCG gets a lot more visibility in the future and gets over the hump it's dealing with on YouTube and various other sites, because I ain't even get into how much Google fucks it up. And that's it for me for the most part. This is every thought and opinion that I have about the Pokemon TCG inside the game and around the game. I think this game is a great starting point in terms of learning how to play the Pokemon TCG and what makes it even better is the fact that the Pokemon TCG hasn't changed much since even the old days. I mean obviously the numbers are gigantic now, but in terms of like the game flow, you can pretty much understand how modern day Pokemon works just by knowing the rules. It's that simple of a game. It's definitely in the category of easy to play hard to master. Just a few more things before I sign off. First off, huge thank you to all my Patreon supporters and my Twitch subs. Another big thank you to all the subscribers and people who have liked and shared my past videos. 
This video took a while to make. The original video was made back in October, August, and I scrapped the whole thing after a bad case of insomnia and remade it from the ground up during January till just about now, which is April. <laughs> I think I'm gonna go back to talking about one or two Yu-Gi-Oh games before tackling Magic the Gathering. Hopefully I could get each video done within a month. It won't take nearly as long, don't worry. Also, I've been getting a lot of requests to talk about Forbidden Memories, and all I can say about that is if you really want me to talk about that game, get me to, I don't know, 50k subscribers and I'll do it. I have no intention on talking about it anytime really soon, but if that happens, then sure, why not? For those who want to know the little details about why it took so long to make this video, um, besides what I said earlier were that I scrapped the whole thing, uh, I had a bad case of insomnia around October and that lasted all the way till the holidays for the most part. So I wasn't really able to like sit down and work with the video until January, which by the way, the video was already done at that point, but I was not happy with what was there. It was, it wasn't bad. It was okay. But I scrapped the whole thing up and said to myself, I think I could do way better. Around that time I got After Effects too. So I was, I definitely wanted to challenge myself for the most part at that point. Um, no other video is really going to take that long. If it's an hour long video, it's going to take a month. If it's a two hour long video, it's just two months. This video took pretty much three months to make a month of like tearing the old video apart. Two months for uh, each hour. Stream shall be back after this video is out. Friday YouTube streams should be coming back along with my Twitch streams coming on Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursdays. Also this weekend is the Pokemon Regional in Orlando and I plan to stop by there just to play some games. Probably in a tournament for the Pokemon TCG, I'm going to be playing Cham Pao. If you recognize me, you're free to talk to me. I'm just going to be handing out business cards the whole time over there and chilling my channel. <laughs> Anyways, y'all take it easy, alright?